Good morning! Good morning everyone! Good morning. Oh, good morning, good morning! I feel as if I should do when I'm going to a school and do my clap and make, make, them, make them do it back. <laughs> good morning everyone! And a warm welcome to Wednesday. A warm welcome to Wednesday. I hope everyone was encouraged by Archbishop Stephen's charge last night to have a good night's sleep. Everyone had a good night's sleep? Yes, no, yes, no. A restful night's sleep, perhaps, a restful night's sleep. Well, I hope today you're going to be uh, continue to be encouraged by our speakers and our workshops. Uh, don't forget uh, to sign up for the workshops. Uh, needless to say, you don't have to do that, but please do take the opportunity to do that or recharge your batteries if that's what uh, you need at present. Uh, there's just a couple of uh, notices with regards to the workshops, just to draw to your attention. The Clergy Support Trust uh, is not going to be with us today, so if you signed up for the Clergy Support Trust workshop... <laughs> he's, he's not coming! <laughs> he's not coming! <laughs> And I have to say, he texted me that last night at about five past eleven. So he's 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 not coming. It's it's quite quite a, a trip for him. Uh, um, and so he confirmed that to me about half past seven this morning that he's not coming. So, but he did say, if anyone needs support, please do <laughs> <laughs> please do go on their website. 
website. <laughs> no, 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 he didn't say we were on our own. He said, go to their website. Go to their website. And he will send literature if you need it. So that's a clergy support. Well, at least that's made everybody laugh this morning. The Clergy Support Trust, but um, on a more positive note, a more positive note, um, we've got the pastoral, pastoral supervision workshops at two o'clock and four o'clock. And it's been said after Bishop Julie's um, Bible study yesterday, they're really encouraging folk to go to that. Now, I'm... <laughs> no, no, I wasn't in. <laughs> I wasn't in the Bishop Julie's workshop, so I've no idea what went on there either, because I was busy welcoming people in, in the entrance. Um, but no, joking apart, joking apart, uh, two o'clock and four o'clock, the pastoral supervision workshops, um, please do uh, take advantage of that if, if you feel that would be um, an advantage to you. I think that's all the things I've got about workshops. I think that's all, all the fun for the morning finished with now. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Order, 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 order. <laughs> We've got Bishop Sam to look forward to any minute. <laughs> Minute, any minute. Just a few other notices, a few other notices. I'll, I'll behave now, I'll behave now. Um, rural clergy, if you are rural clergy, Alec Brown and Anne Lawson are, are, are meeting in the bar at 1.30 at lunchtime if you would like to go meet with them uh, to talk about rural ministry. That's 1.30 at lunchtime. Please do call into the marketplace. Uh, there's lots of things going on in the marketplace, and the people in there said there's lots of people walking past the doors, but not a lot of people going in there. So please do take the opportunity to go, go into the uh, marketplace. There's lots of things going on in there. Also, we've got uh, Shemin Nerf with us, um, you know, um, and they ha have said about their prayer space, which is in the main conference hall. Now, folk are getting very confused between the main conference hall and the Derbyshire hall. The main conference hall is right the way down by the croquet lawn. They are in there and offering to, uh, to pray with you. They're there for chaplaincy, so please do... Uh, if there's something weighing heavy on your heart and you really want to go and have a chat with somebody, Shemin North are more than happy, more than happy to chat with you um, in the main conference hall. Uh, there's a bookshop in the vinery. Uh, lots of books there. Please do take advantage of that. And then uh, we come to this evening. Uh, we've got our quiz. Where's Mike? Where's Mike? Oh, there he is. He's going to be our quiz. I don't know whether he's going to have the gold lame suit like Ian did last year. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, but we've got the quiz here in the Derbyshire Hall. Um, 7.30 start, and there is going to be a bottle bar here, so you haven't got to bring your drinks up from the bar. There's going to be a bar out here, a bottle bar, starting at 7.30. And if that wasn't enough for you, at 10 o'clock, following Compline, there is going to be DJ worship in the chapel. Woo! Exactly, woo! At uh, 10 o'clock in the chapel, if you feel you don't need to go to bed at 10 o'clock but want to go and do a bit of raving on down in the chapel, 10 o'clock is the time. DJ worship in the, in the chapel. I think, I think that is all the notices for the time being. Before I hand over to Bishop... Su oh, Diane, yes, gosh, yes. After me asking, is Diane with us this morning? She is at the back. There she is at the back. Yeah. Well, I don't have to say that she's fine because she's there at the back. But she is fine. She is fine. I don't think she ended up going to hospital in the end. But uh, thank you to everybody who uh, supported her last night. Um, she is, as I say, at the back with us today. Thanks for all the support. Lots of people prayed for her. And it's really lovely that she, she's with us this morning. So uh, lovely to see you, Diane. I, I, I forgot that. I, that was my first thing I wrote down. I got carried away with my what I was doing, wasn't I? Uh, we are going to, we're going to see now a PowerPoint before I um, hand over to Bishop Sam for our Bible study. We're going to see a PowerPoint now which has been put together uh, from the Oak Community Project at Christ the King in Birkenhead. 
and it is Denise, the community worker, who's going to be telling us all about how they're serving the community in Birkenhead. and family work at Christ the King. Um, Christ the King is situated in Birkenhead and um, I run the Oak Community Project. The Oak Community Project was born in 2012 to serve the surrounding community. Um, we're in our storeroom, so you can see behind me um, a lot of stock. Each week we make up around 120 community food bags and several hampers. We have a lot of people who are lonely, uh, with mental health problems, lots of single parents, and a lot of people with just no hope. What about other volunteers? Sometimes described the people who came in as hopeless. And she wasn't meaning that in a nasty way, she was meaning they just didn't have any hope. So as we offer food, um, crisis food, and food that people can donate for personal donation, we also offer a uh, nice social guidance, but We've got my there, a chest in the gosh, we will show them all um, in a practical way. We don't judge people, we don't discriminate against people, and it's too easy to judge. Far too easy to judge people. I've done it myself. We've, we've had one woman come in not long ago in a big axe bag, first up to the eyes, lips, without shoes, and again, there's me rolling my eyes, thinking there's another one. The poor lady broke down, she absolutely broke down as a result of her but she lost absolutely everything that she had. A house was getting repossessed, a car was getting repossessed, she had no money to feed the children. And we're trying to help many, many different people at the community centre through drug abuse, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, poverty, benefits advice. If we can't help them here, we try our absolute best to point them in the right direction where we can go. Hi, my name's Gray. Uh, I actually come here to church on a Sunday at the Christ the King. But I also come up on a Tuesday to get my bags. Um, it's nice to be here and to meet some people and have a chat and get to know people from the congregation better and also people from the community because we have quite a varied selection coming through, which uh, makes it all good, because we're, we're spreading the love. Brilliant work going on at the Oak Community Project. If you haven't been down there, oh! It's, is it not finished? It has finished. They put me on the spot this morning, most definitely for all. It has finished. It has been brilliant project. If you haven't been down there, I've been down there. Yeah, the church is a bit like a TARDIS when you go in. There's so much going on with the, with the community down there. So brilliant to hear that. I'm now going to hand over to Bishop Sam. Shall we pray for um, that project? Um, yeah. Leanne for Gray. Yeah. For Denise. Uh, not just that people would be fed, but they would be nourished. Uh, with hope uh, and as we pray for that food bank so we're praying for all of the other similar projects that we're aware of uh, and that we support perhaps a couple of people would lead us in prayer for those projects through our churches and in particular we, we pray for the Oak Project and thank you for the work that's happening there. We pray that we may all have churches that offer <coughs> hope to those who are hopeless, that offer love to those who find no love elsewhere. And we pray that your glory and your love may shine through us and that all that we do may be to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Father, we pray for that lady that lost everything due to, due to the pandemic and the many hundreds or maybe even thousands of people like her. Just pray, Lord God, that you would uh, be, be for her the 
strength that she needs and the, give her the hope of eternal salvation and provision in your love, in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who serve at the Oak Project and others like it, that they and we would be equipped by your Spirit, that their words and ours would be seasoned with salt, full of grace, that they and we would be ready always to give an answer for the hope which you've given us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, you feed the hungry with good things. Your mother Mary showed us how to give back love through generosity and being open to you. Help us to feed each other and others who are different than us with the good news of your love in word, spirit, and sacrifice, especially in this Christian aid week. And pray that in seeing goodness in us, they may find the service of you, God, who is good all the time. Amen. Amen. A lot of the time when <coughs> the events are needed, when um, everybody has their first share, you know, so that time when you pray, you are back and on all of you, and on all clients, and on all those things, and that's what you Amen. Lord, as the cost of living increases, give us eyes to see where the opportunities are to serve. Help us to be that light that shines brightly brings other people in. Amen. Amen. And so, Father, as we turn now to your word, say so we pray you administer to us that through the word spoken you will illuminate the word written and draw us closer to the word living, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So I've really been looking forward to speaking to you this morning. <laughs> it was a great relief to know that the person from the Clergy Support Trust didn't say talk to Bishop Sam, or Bishop Sam will cover it all in his talk. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> or maybe that was the rest of the message. Jill, thank you for the doctrine of reserve. Um, <laughs> You may be surprised to know that I've taken as the inspiration for my text, Mark chapter 1. <laughs> so we'll start at verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. I wonder how you hear those early verses in Mark's Gospel. Beginning Gospel Jesus, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far sorry, that's a, a, the other prophet. And then that quotation from uh, Isaiah, and then there's the Jesus going up to John being in the water, uh, and then the 40 days in the wilderness, and then walking along the Sea of Galilee to Andrew and Simon, this side, to James and John, this side. And it's like a scene from Reservoir Dogs, isn't it, as the music gathers, or <laughs> Peaky Blinders as they walk down the streets of Galilee. There's a speed and an intensity to it until they get to those healings that we just take in our stride, because Mark covers it so quickly. But break it down a bit more and think what's going on. Here is the one who left all the glory of heaven behind in order to come to earth. 
who right from before he was born has chosen to associate himself with us and the mess and reality of this world, the mess and reality of our existence. Who chooses to associate himself with that in the waters of the River Jordan and then is led into the desert by the Spirit of God. Thanks, Spirit of God, for making appointments for me in the wilderness for 40 days of excruciating temptation. We rode over it quickly as if it's like bish, bash, bosh, on. But 40 days alone, without resources, being scratched away at the identity which was revealed with all of the ready breck glow and the halo, now being scratched away over 40 days. If. as Jesus clings fast to who he is and resists those temptations, which will not just be for 40 days, but which will continue to circle around him all through his earthly ministry, even when he's on the cross. If, if, if. And then his cousin John is arrested as he comes into Galilee and says, now is the time. The kingdom of God is fulfilled. I don't know what your experiences of ordained ministry have been like, whether it's all been ready, break, glow and halos. I've found myself time and time again looking at visions of Jesus in stained glass and being ever so grateful that that halo has a cross in it. That Jesus understands from the inside the realities of the world's pain and needs and the realities of ministry. I don't know how you've found the experiences of the last couple of years. Some of you will have thrived and found that you got into your stride quicker than you ever expected and have found a new lease of life and have uncovered all kinds of new gifts and skills and callings. Praise God for that. Others of you have perhaps had an experience similar to mine where it felt like the whole world was closing in on you and everything felt huge and you felt small and alone and asking all kinds of questions that you would never dare say out loud. Maybe you've been in that place in other times. Have I made the biggest mistake of my life? Do I need to move? God, if only I could get a different church warden. <laughs> if only this, if only that. If only. And into the midst of that situation where the world feels constrictive and you smell, feel small and alone, Christ comes proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near. Now is the time. Because it's never about us and how we're feeling. It's always about him and what he is able to do. Not with the ready break glow, but the one who walks into the place of darkness and cost and pain and restriction, and yet somehow manages to push back the horizons, to lift us up to draw alongside us and to give us the strength to articulate the questions and the doubts and the concerns and holds us, enfolds us in the midst of that and does amazing things through us, amazing things without us and amazing things despite us. And maybe we've seen some of that over the last couple of years as well. 
One of the privileges of being a bishop is to go into churches and to confirm people. You will do the hard work, we get the good bits. When I was growing up, I spent loads of time on a farm just tractor driving. I was never allowed to drive the combine harvester. Sometimes it feels like I've got the keys to the combine because I get to hear story after story of how God has been at work in people's lives. People really, really young. And I used to think I knew what age people should be confirmed. But when you hear a young person articulating better than many a BAP candidate what it means to follow Jesus... (laughs) It's amazing being converted again by a seven-year-old, isn't it? Or by an 81-year-old who says, you know, I've put it off all my life. And yet through this experience and through the careful words of a gifted, skilled priest, now is the time. Confirm it, Lord. It's a huge privilege. Because regardless of what's going on in the world... God is always at work. Now is the time. These unusual experiences for us, which are actually usual experiences for the majority of people in the majority of the world, as we are forced to realise that we are not in control and are called to follow one who doesn't try to control the world but just beautifully leads himself And in this season, I find myself again and again gripped by Jesus and how in the midst of restriction and constriction and oppression, he just leads himself. As the Archbishop was saying yesterday, takes himself off for rest, sleeps in the midst of a storm, just is somehow able to lead himself. And my goodness, how different that is from the kind of leadership that we see so often in our screens as people try and assert control or not take responsibility or those kind of things. And yet here is Jesus, always taking responsibility, always leading, and somehow even in the place of oppression and restriction, managing to create freedom, to express freedom for himself and to, and to draw others into that freedom. There's a wonderful Catholic writer called Brendan Byrne who has a commentary on Mark's Gospel called Costly Freedom. I often try and summarise books of the Bible in one or two sentences or in a couple of words or identify a verse or a story which kind of unlocks the whole thing. Costly Freedom, what he's trying to say is that Jesus comes with a proclamation of freedom and yet in himself and in the community that he calls to himself, he's, he's very clear that there's cost. This is my beloved son, as Jesus associates himself with the sin of the world. This is my beloved son, listen to him, in chapter 9 as he's transfigured. But that's bookended by Jesus talking about his death and resurrection. Truly this was God's son, says the centurion, as Jesus is on the cross. This costly freedom. Those words might not work for you. So what words would? How would you summarise what's going on here? As Christ comes into the midst of difficulty, which he experiences himself and proclaims freedom and calls people into that kind of freedom with a halo, with a cross straight through the middle of it. Sisters and brothers, thank you for your ministry over the last few years. It's early days for us as bishops as we still get to know you and to hear the stories of your context and the stories of your ministries. But we've heard enough to be able to eyeball you and to say thank you. Thank you for your ministry and thank you for your lives of generosity. For it's to lives of generosity that we are called to walk with Jesus, not in lives of sacrifice. Don't define it like that. Reframe it as a life of generosity. It only becomes sacrifice when it meets with human sin. That's what you see in Jesus, isn't it? Living a life of generosity that becomes sacrifice when it meets with human sin. Thank you for your ministry of generosity, for pouring yourself out. But also know that this is not the end. 
that we need to take time to regroup, to learn lessons. But this may well be more of a pattern for the future than it has been in the past. And in the midst of all of the difficulty, the restrictions, the questions that we ask of ourselves, the questions we wish we could ask of other people, Christ is with us, creating spaces of freedom in the midst of cost teaching us what it means to follow, calling us to be faithful, strengthening us in our ministries, and gifting to us all that we need so that we might live those lives of generosity. <coughs> the kingdom of God has come near. And the time is now. For God is at work in Birkenhead, at school gates, supermarket checkouts, petrol station forecourts, all those equivalents of liminal places like beaches where he's calling people to himself. Uh, I'm supposed to answer the question, what do we need uh, to leave behind? Uh, I love Zebedee. I mean, we don't hear much about him, do we, until he gets a, comes, a, comes out of retirement and gets a starring role in the Magic Roundabout. But actually, <laughs> I think... Zebedee's got a lot to say to people in our churches. Can you imagine? You've been waiting all of your life for those boys to grow up. And the sniff of the pension of the easier days is in sight. They can take the strain. And then along comes some carpenter and nicks them. OK, I'll just get the nets. I'll put out the chairs then. I'll carry on as church warden then. <laughs> is one possible way of responding. Or to say to them, you go. I'm too old, but you go. Zebedee the generous, with his permission, with his prayers, with his financial support. It's not actually so much about what these disciples leave behind, I don't think. It's actually about what they're being called into. They're being called into a new community. And I love the way in which Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. All of that stuff that dear Father Zebedee has imparted to them isn't left behind on the beach. All of those lessons they need to take with them. That, and maybe it's because Jesus is always a carpenter. The one whose naked flesh was pressed against the wood of a manger as his naked flesh is pressed against the wood of a cross is still a carpenter. Shaping those rough-hewn beans, unlocking their potential and making them into a table around which all the nations of the world will gather making them into a door through which people will pass, making them into a lintel under which people will find a home. Always, always a carpenter. And he says to these guys, you come and always be fishermen. It's unpredictable. You're not in control. It's going to be hard work. You'll need to work together. All of those skills that you've learned since you were kids, come and use those now as I teach you to fish for people. Don't leave behind experiences that you have spent years gaining. Don't leave behind lessons that God has spent years teaching you, because it really winds him up. <laughs> when I went to my last parish, I prayed about, Lord, what do you want me to do in this place? And I Spent my teenage years, uh, as did another bishop not too far from me, uh, driving tractors, as I said before. And he said to me just very clearly, farm, farm the soil. It's like, <laughs> Lord, it's the middle of Leeds. It's a city centre. <laughs> and he's like, farm the soil. And I knew what he meant. And the reason why I questioned was because I've never worked so hard in all my life. When I was doing an agricultural chaplaincy carol service recently, someone said, why did you become a vicar? I said, because I used to work seven days a week and I wanted a job where I only have to work one day a week. And so I've literally never worked so hard in all my life as a teenager. It's really hard work, working again, you know, all the country file, turn that off. It's much harder, much more gruelling existence. More like ordained ministry, actually and the reality of having to till the soil. Nobody sees, no one understands all that you do, but yet that secret hidden work, both within me and within the parish, through the processes, the structures, the paperwork, 
unpicking stuff where people have made shortcuts. Never do that, because someone further down the line is going to have to go back over it, and it's much more complicated and takes much longer to do it. So be good stewards of all that God has given to you. But I couldn't have done that work, I don't think, if I'd not spent all of those teenage years up and down, up and down, day after day, learning how to till soil. And I wonder what lessons God has taught you in the past, even when you were children, that are resources and gifts to you that you need to draw on. Because they're the particular way in which God has invested you, has shaped you, has moulded you. And now is the time, but you need to draw on those resources and those lessons. And we need to be continually helping people to do the same in our churches as well, which is the response to Love Day's question, I think, that she rightly asked of what we were talking about yesterday. How do we help people who are engaged in all kinds of things, in all kinds of places in our world, to make sense of this and to understand that this stuff isn't removed from ministry, but actually is ministry? And the things that they are learning in their workplaces are the things that God is deliberately trying to teach them so that they might be better ministers in and among their families, their workplaces, wherever God has placed them, because that's how God works. The Gospel of Mark is firmly rooted in Galilee, isn't it? What an unsexy place that would be. That vacancy would be advertised for a while, I tell you. You'd you'd keep seeing that one coming around and around and again. And How does the Gospel end? There's very little about the resurrection, Mark just says, particularly in the shorter ending, Jesus is alive, hallelujah. There's no hallelujah, but he meant to include it. Um, (laughs) Go back to Galilee and wait for him. Galilee, Galilee. We've left Galilee. We don't want to go back to old Father Zeb. Why is Jesus coming there? Well, because that's where we work out our salvation. (coughs) That's where we work it out. Not in the next parish, but where God has placed us now. Not when we're just in church, but when we're at home, irritated by our families almost as much as they are irritated by us. That's where we work out what it means that Jesus is risen and that Jesus sits at the right hand of God as the longer ending of Mark ends, still marked with the wounds of his passion. So that as the father gazes on his son, what he's confronted with is the reality of human experience. Because God, who is with us in Galilee, knows what that means from the inside. When the world is constricted and restricted and we feel small and that we're all alone, well, Christ, who is at the Father's right hand, is with us in ways that go far beyond all we could ask or imagine. The other reason why I think it's bad to leave things behind is because we're too quick to escape things that we need to pay attention to. I know this is being live streamed, so this is a bit of a risk, but I sometimes get really wound up by new Christians. (laughs) Because everything turns out brilliantly, doesn't it? (laughs) And so quickly. You know, I prayed and then this happened, and you're like, brilliant. Just you wait. (laughs) Because there is a sense, a beautiful way in which God works with us, I think. And I've certainly learned this in my own life. And maybe this is just me. That when I made a recommitment to God on the 19th of February, 1999, so much of God's grace literally kind of came around me and held me in the midst of my confusion and questions. And there was so much I needed to, to sort out. And... And actually what's happened over the years since then is bit by little bit, God has just brought me to confront some of that stuff that he was holding in a time where I had the space, even though sometimes it didn't feel like it, and just confronted me with it and said, and what are we going to do about this? And sometimes that's just been on retreat or in prayer. Sometimes that's been through just being aware of, hang on, this 
keeps coming up again and again. Sometimes it's been through the words of other people. Why do you always do this? And thinking, oh, I probably need to attend to that. Sometimes it's been through the words of a therapist. You, you really don't need to carry this around, you know. We, we can do some work with this. Sometimes it's been through the words of a spiritual director. And God has gifted me back some of those things that I struggled with or some of those experiences that were difficult and I just longed to get away from. And with that beautiful, grace-riven way in which God works, where I'm secure, standing on that firm foundation, surrounded by his people, those who love and hold me, it's been possible to rework some of that stuff. When it first started to happen, I thought I was backsliding or that things were going wrong or that I was doing something wrong. And actually, I've come to realise that that's often how God works. And the things that we think are undermining us or distracting us or are pulling us away from what's most important are actually the things that will save us. Because that's how God works with us. And it may be that you don't recognise that experience, or it may be that you're in a particularly intense time where that's happening for you. Or it may be that you know there's something you need to attend to, but it feels too big and scary. Well, the one who comes proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near is the one who casts out fear, who enables us to look at our past without fear, to be real about where we are in the present, and to know with certainty where we're going into the future, to walk in freedom, knowing that he is with us, even when it feels like the world is closing in on us. So there are things that we need to leave behind, of course there are, but most of the time it's actually about taking hold of who we really are, because in those experiences, that's where we find out who God really is, who we're truly called to be, and that's where we make a home in places that feel unfamiliar or drive us mad. In the middle of nowhere, to a bunch of no-hopers, in the midst of foreign oppression, of political insecurity and economic uncertainty, having experienced himself, threat, temptation, opposition, with his beloved cousin arrested, Jesus comes and says, the kingdom of God is near, now is the time. As we gather here in this place, so that one comes to us with his message of freedom, gripping us by the hand, enfolding us in his nail-marked hands and holding us and saying again, follow me and come to Galilee and let me make you fishers of men. May God continue to bless you in your ministry, a ministry that we as bishops are privileged to share with you. Amen. Amen.